across the, the portfolio. Uh, I think it's important to reflect upon why investing in infrastructure is important. It has an opportunity to uh, create jobs in the short term, certainly, uh, but to build stronger communities and more vibrant economies if we make smart investment decisions uh, that will help set the stage for long-term economic growth and to build uh, healthy, livable communities. Uh, there's a number of different ways uh, that I can see this happening. You don't have to think too long before you come up with the kinds of examples of essential infrastructure that the federal government funds in your own communities. Uh, in fact, I'd hazard to guess there's not a, a member of parliament here whose riding hasn't benefited from tens or perhaps hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in federal infrastructure investments since 2015. Um, the different kinds of uh, infrastructure that you'll see we tend to focus on uh, will include municipal infrastructure, uh, like water and wastewater to help enable more housing output, uh, public transit infrastructure to make sure people in communities, both big and small, have an opportunity to access the services and opportunities uh, that set them and their families up for success, uh, different kinds of uh, roads or bridge projects uh, that are essential uh, for transportation networks and communities uh, of different sizes, uh, including uh, climate resilient uh, infrastructure infrastructure to make sure that uh, our communities are set up to withstand uh, the challenges of more severe weather events uh, with a changing climate, uh, making sure that we're making the investments to help ensure that we have uh, access to clean electricity to not only power our communities today, but to solicit industrial opportunities from uh, clean growth uh, uh, players uh, in the economy who are pursuing clean growth opportunities in Canada. Uh, also recreational, cultural and heritage infrastructure that make our communities more vibrant and dynamic places to live. Uh, as you go through each of these different types of infrastructure, you're realize that in most instances there's some kind of a corresponding federal fund to help out with the cost. Um, I mentioned uh, municipal uh, infrastructure including water and wastewater. Um, this is a, an essential thing not only to put people to work uh, who are uh, installing the pipes uh, that, that are necessary for a functioning water and wastewater system, uh, but also to make sure that we can build more houses, achieve what's become a, a major social concern for Canadians, particularly young Canadians, uh, by ensuring we're building out the housing stock to cure the supply gap that exists. This is where the new Canada Housing and Infrastructure Fund comes in. It's a $6 billion fund uh, where we're contributing to the cost of these municipal infrastructure projects, uh, but are also negotiating with uh, municipalities and provinces to ensure that as we make investments in infrastructure, decisions are being taken at a more local level to ensure that we get the most out of infrastructure that already exists, which is going to reduce the cost for municipal taxpayers, but also make it uh, cheaper for people to live in communities uh, near the services and opportunities that uh, and infrastructure infrastructure, frankly, that already exists. Uh, some of the ways that we're uh, going to do this is to uh, say to our partners in negotiations, you can have access to this money uh, if you adopt certain kinds of changes, uh, including more as of right zoning to make it easier to maximize the capacity of existing infrastructure, uh, including by uh, placing a freeze on development cost charges so we don't just increase the cost of building new homes, which places the price further out of reach for people who are not already in the market. Uh, having uh, adoption of the designs that will be in the upcoming national National Home Design Catalog and a series of other measures that are designed to make it easier and faster to build homes and to reduce the cost pressures on that infrastructure. Uh, similarly, with public transit, uh, we're not just saying we're transferring money, uh, carte blanche, uh, to build out a, a system with no federal input. Uh, we want to make sure that we have enough riders for those systems and want to increase density within walking distance to the transit stations so we're building more sustainable uh, public transit systems uh, that will allow us to get the most return for every dollar that we invest. Uh, when it comes to uh, community and cultural spaces, it's important to me that we continue to invest uh, in particular to the Green and Inclusive Community Building Fund, which received a top up of $400 million in the recent federal budget on top of a $4 billion program, which is helping ensure that communities have access to those vibrant uh, community and cultural spaces. Uh, there's a number of different funds uh, that we continue to have uh, on the table, whether it's the Disaster Mitigation Adaptation Fund, uh, provincially managed uh, uh, funds that are run through bilateral agreements such as the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Plan uh, or uh, funds that may support infrastructure that are run through other departments like the National Trade Corridors Fund uh, or uh, funds through Heritage Canada for cultural spaces. Um, you'll see that this is a priority uh, for uh, the current federal government uh, because we want to help uh, with the uh, the cost of building communities and uh, we would be very happy to take what questions you may have on our plans to do so. Thank you so much everyone. Pleasure to be here. Thank you very much Minister. We'll begin our line of questioning today with Dr. Lewis. Dr. Lewis, the floor is yours. You have six minutes, please. Yes, thank you, Minister, for appearing today. I just want to turn um, to some of the 
uh, issues that you mentioned under housing. Now, in the City of Toronto, uh, since the Liberals signed their Housing Accelerator Fund Agreement, and that was in December 2023, housing starts are down by 21%. And housing starts in Toronto in Q1 period of 2023 were 6,568. And in Q1 2024, they were 5,188. And you testified at HUMA, uh, you confirm that freezing or lowering development charges was not a precondition of any housing accelerator agreements. Can you confirm that freezing or lowering development charges was not a condition in Toronto's uh, $471 million HAF agreement? Uh, so first uh, through you, uh, Mr. Chair, on the issue of housing starts in the first quarter nationally, we saw an increase of 16%. Uh, we are seeing some downward pressure as a result of higher interest rates being uh, priced into the system uh, when people are looking to start or, or not start a project, which is why we continue to put more measures on the table, such as uh, tax cuts, uh, changes to municipal zoning and, and other measures to help speed up the pace of construction. With respect to the issue of development cost charges, we've decided to do that through the Canada Housing Infrastructure fund. I'll note uh, one point of contrast between our plans is the Conservative plan that was put forward includes no measures uh, to address the issue of development cost charges. They're very real uh, in terms of their impact on housing affordability and production, uh, uh, but we've chosen to Minister, do that through a different way. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I, I'd like to move on to ask you about um, specific development charges since you raised that. Now, from 20, 20, 2013 to 2020. Three development charges increased in Toronto by 370%. On May 1st, 2024, five months after signing the HAF agreement, Toronto raised development charges by an additional 20.7%. When you were here last time in committee, uh, you, you did touch on this, but I want you to commit today... Um, Minister, that you will rectify this and that those charges to homeowners will be reimbursed to them in some capacity. S sorry, wh the, which charges? You're talking about a reimbursement. There's no money that's come to the federal government to be reimbursed. Could I just get clarity, Mr. Chair, on, on what, what monies are, uh, the federal government's received that you're seeking to have reimbursed? The HAF agreement is specifically what I'm speaking about, Minister. You're uh, familiar with that, correct? Yes, but but just a point of clarity, the, the question asks for a reimbursement. You're talking about the Housing Accelerator Fund, but you asked for the reimbursement to be paid to residents. I'm just, I'm trying to figure out which money residents would have uh, paid that you're now asking to be reimbursed. Just, well, we just know that taxes of, on development charges are a significant impediment to getting more houses built, correct? Is that not correct? Yes, I agree. And it is a primary reason why projects are no longer... Um, penciled out, correct? Uh, I wouldn't say it's a primary. It's, it's one of several important factors. Well, you have given $4.4 billion without addressing this, and no homes have been built. Isn't that correct, Minister? Uh, no, that's not correct. Uh, neither the $4.4 billion figure or the fact that no homes have been built. Both of those are incorrect. Well, Minister, isn't it... Uh, isn't it how much more time do I have? Two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. Minister, isn't it a fact that... <laughs> The major impediment right now in building homes are these development charges, and we have seen these costs increase, especially in the City of Toronto, by 370%. And you have no, not made a commitment to do anything to lower these costs for these residents. Uh, that, Will you commit to that today? Uh, that, that's also false. In fact, this was a key feature of the recent Canada Housing and Infrastructure Fund. I find it curious as well that the Conservative plan, which has been published and has draft legislation that's sitting, waiting to be brought forward, has no measures that address the issue of development cost charges. We're literally the only party who's actually put forward a plan that includes specific measures to address them. So... Uh, and again, if you're going to look for someone who's actually authorized the use of development cost charges, they're authorized for municipalities used by provincial legislation. So if you want to raise the issue with someone who has not been clear on their position, you can talk to your party leader or perhaps you could uh, write to the provincial conservative government in Ontario. Uh, but when it comes to development cost charges, we have put forward a plan that will limit increases to the Canada Housing and Infrastructure Fund compared to your own party who, despite your questions today, 
has yet to put forward any plan to address these issues. Well, Minister, that, that's not what the residents of Toronto are feeling. Uh, let me just ask about the CMHC um, situation here. Now, Minister, how many CEO, how many um, C CMHC staff have received bonuses? And did the CEO of CM CMHC receive a bonus this year? I don't know the answer to how many staff members would have received uh, bonuses. I don't know uh, if our deputy minister has that information. I, I, I do not. That would be um, through the board of directors of CMHC. Uh, well, there's been 27 million in bonuses in 2023 that was paid by tax that that were paid by taxpayers, and these same taxpayers can't afford to buy these homes. Yet they are paying executives and staff at CMHC for bonuses for homes that have th there's been no increase in the homes built in 2023 isn't that correct mi minister Sorry, I've got the microphone. Uh, look, my, my view when it comes to uh, compensation for those who work for Crown Corporations of the Public Service is it should be uh, independent of the uh, elected levels. I think that's a, a recipe for uh, your disaster. Minister, uh, the, thank you, oh, Dr. We're, we're Lewis. Being, uh, we're unfortunately out of time minutes, there, the and I'm trying to respect everybody's time. Uh, next up, we have Mr. Yakano. Mr. Yakano, la parole est à vous. Vous avez six minutes, s'il vous plaît. You have the floor, uh, Mr. Yakano. Six minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, welcome, uh, Mr. Minister. It's always a pleasure to have you here. Now, we've seen some uh, results of investments in clean energy from infrastructure. You have concluded, I think, a partnership with Nova Scotia Power and the Prime Minister of the province, Premier of the province. Can you tell us more about this uh, investment in uh, your province and why would the Conservatives be against this type of positive um, investments, particularly, in fact, uh, they're in Indigenous communities. Thank you, Mr. Yakano, for the question and for the um, issues and stakes that are high for Nova Scotia. We have here an opportunity to support uh, communities with uh, their visions for the future, using all the opportunities available through the green uh, energy or green economy funds. These are very high stakes uh, opportunities. Uh, our status as far as progress in the field is not as much as other provinces, uh, but some communities have an ideal opportunity to use electricity, um, particularly indigenous communities. We have new partnerships with Mi'kmaq communities who are prepared to uh, use these uh, investments for clean storage for electricity utility and supported by the uh, Canada Infrastructure Bank. Uh, this is going to create economic opportunities for the communities who are participating in the, the initiative, but it's also going to help uh, launch a systemic solution to store more green uh, uh, energy storage as our renewable production goes up, but we still have a reliance on uh, certain fossil fuels, including coal, uh, which we need to transition away from quickly. Uh, this creates an enormous opportunity to um, uh, support the economic imperative of um, uh, helping Mi'kmaq communities that are seeking to grow, uh, while at the same time uh, greening the grid for everyone to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels and pursue additional industrial opportunities in the green economy. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Minister, it's important to highlight the significant contributions of the Canada Infrastructure Bank across the nation. The CIBC investments have resulted in a reduction of 8.3 metric tons of annual greenhouse gas emissions. Investments in 46 Indigenous communities, financing for 5,466 zero emissions buses and a broadband collectivity for over 434,000 homes. Could you discuss the, the significance of these investments by the CIB throughout Canada? And additionally, also, what are the reasons? You had also mentioned that. What are the reasons for the Conservative Party's opposition to initiate to initiatives aimed at reducing greenhouse gas emissions. 
Uh, look, it's, it's not for me to uh, speak to the motivations that other parties may have. I know there's notable conservatives who've expressed uh, uh, support for the infrastructure bank in the past, and uh, conservative provincial governments who are actually now considering the idea of moving forward with their own complementary initiatives. Uh, to the advantages, I'm very happy to, to speak to. This creates an opportunity to um, crowd in uh, private funding uh, to build out infrastructure that serves a, a public purpose. It's an opportunity for us to solicit additional private investment in projects that are going to achieve an important public goal that will help drive economic opportunities for Canadians as well. Uh, when we see uh, billions of dollars in money that's paid back, uh, by the way, uh, invested in projects, that can then in turn pull in billions of dollars of additional private capital, more things get done than otherwise wouldn't get done. And the kinds of things that get done are high-speed internet in, in rural communities, our public transit in major urban centres, our emissions-reducing projects in buildings and in communities right across the country, and as we discussed in response uh, to your last question, uh, economic opportunities for uh, communities that have too often been left behind, including, uh, given as if you've, you've raised it in your question now, uh, the opportunity for more Indigenous Indigenous communities uh, to take part in uh, a growing economy, particularly a growing green economy. Uh, so from my perspective, from a, a social and economic and an environmental uh, point of view, uh, the Canada Infrastructure Bank, given its recent uh, uptick in, in volume and, and the pace at which they're operating, uh, is uh, checking the boxes on, on all three categories. Thank you, Minister. Uh, you mentioned in your opening, um, in, in replying to my co colleague across prior to me, that uh, we have a plan and they don't. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Uh, so the uh, the answer that I uh, I gave was in response specifically to development cost charges, uh, given the questions that were coming in. And development cost charges create a very real increase in the cost of building, which is passed on uh, through the economy in um, either or both of higher home prices uh, or uh, a reduced number of homes that are, are built overall. Um, despite the line of questioning that we've seen uh, both today and at a recent committee appearance, uh, appearance from one of our colleagues, Mr. Aitchison, who I've got great respect for, um, there's not a plan from the Conservative Party to actually address development cost charges. Now, they have tabled a housing plan. They have put forward legislation uh, that their leader uh, presumably will move forward with at some point, but it doesn't include anything on development cost charges. Um, I'm out of time, but happy to pick up uh, should you wish to delve in further. Thank you very much, Minister, and merci à vous, Monsieur Yacono. Prochainement, nous avons Monsieur Barcelon. Mr. Barcelon, you have the floor. Six minutes, please. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, uh, Honorable Minister, for being here today. Uh, uh, we only have an hour with us, of course. I would have appreciated if we even had up to four hours. But in any case, <laughs> in the last budget, uh, there's an item that... Uh, Draw, drew my attention. The government announced its intention to use uh, public funds to uh, create housing on government, in government property, realty, uh, whether buildings, military bases, etc. Well, this is a lot of common good sense here because uh, they're underused. Uh, there's the intention is to do that. We'll have to wait and see what the results are. Some have expressed concerns uh, that afterwards uh, you might decide not to respect municipal bylaws, uh, keeping them under uh, the aegis of federal government, uh, e either through CHMC, the projects pass through the federal government, so municipal bylaws uh, are bypassed. Uh, is that your intention as a government to do that? No, uh, we're looking for uh, opportunities to work with local municipal governments, and it's not to me to take those decisions. Uh, we can't impose rules on local municipalities. Now, if... Uh, if I'm approaching the table with federal resources in hand, I believe it's, a new, it's an opportunity to negotiate uh, terms and conditions for specific developments. But the situation is very, very variable from project to project. Uh, I feel I have to work with the municipal government. So you're going to respect municipal bylaws that are now in effect uh, 
on those lands, uh, those particular project lots. Well, I have no specific plan to avoid uh, respecting municipal bylaws. But if there are regulations that uh, complicate uh, the process towards more housing, better housing, I'd, I'd like to find the rationale for that. Um, in Quebec, the uh, discussions are a lot easier because we've concluded an agreement for the entirety of the province. Well, I ask you the question because there was a federal building, and a concrete example here, and I think it's actually a, a, on the work site in, in uh, old Montreal. The Minister of Justice, well, I mean, it's a, a federal courthouse, so, or for co a house for federal courts. Uh, appeal to the appeal court, the federal court, uh, tax uh, court, etc. The building will cost $160 million, and the construction has begun. Uh, the municipality had no idea what was going to be built there, what it would look like architecturally. The municipality was not consulted, and uh, the, the uh, work site is already uh, busy. Citizens don't even know what they're going to have in a uh, heritage area, uh, the old port area. And so uh, what's going to happen with other projects that you've announced in that budget? As you know full well, uh, projects are very unique by, by definition. Um, if you need to uh, get a further information, I can readily uh, discuss this with my officials and uh, see what we can, perhaps not for this specific project right now, but if you have general concerns. It'd be relatively easy to deal with my office. This is not a systematic problem. It's maybe a one-off. Well, we do see concrete examples in areas that are very sensitive from a heritage point of view where federal construction is going on without having consulted anyone, nor the citizens, nor the heritage committees, nor the government of Quebec, nor the municipality, and all of a sudden, 17-floor 17 tower, 17 tower appears in a neighborhood. I don't know. Uh, I can't understand that kind of behavior on the part of the federal government. Uh, I'd like you to say, well, that's, that's not uh, reasonable. Uh, we're going to do this or that. We don't want to repeat this kind of ex uh, experience because people feel completely disrespected. Uh, very arrogant approach, if you will, from high on down. Well, I'll go and get the details on those projects, but... I, in no way are we going to try to avoid or sidestep municipal bylaws. We have a comprehensive uh, deal with uh, Quebec, so uh, I'll take a look at the specific uh, examples that you've given me after this meeting, and I'll see what I can do to explain that. But there are municipal regulations uh, for construction uh, for a reason. You announced in your budget that it would be infrastructure uh, accelerator fund or uh, the general housing fund. Uh, I, I, the same thing for all the other funds that are um, designated and targeted for specific types of infrastructure projects. So it's, it's not a federal jurisdiction after all. The transport, for example, is shared, but you, you have to consult. Well, in the circumstances, I can't give you a straight answer right now. It's essential to collaborate with all of our partners at the various uh, levels or orders of government in order that the projects go forward efficiently and uh, we get more housing. We do respect the uh, pro provincial jurisdiction. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. And Mr. Baccarat. You have six minutes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Minister, and Ms. Gillis, for being with us today. Um, I met recently with uh, sustainable transportation advocates, and they expressed dismay that the latest budget contains a cut to a couple of key uh, transit funds, the first of which is the Zero Emissions Transit Fund, which is used to purchase electric school buses and electric transit buses 
uh, in their view, this, this fund has been reduced at a time when the impacts of climate change are being felt right across the country and the um, Commissioner for the Environment and Sustainable Development has highlighted that your government is not on track to meet its emissions targets. Why is this government cutting back on the purchase of clean technology at a time when we need to be accelerating our action on climate change? So um, I have a different characterization of, of how you've just uh, described things because as we see certain programs uh, come online, uh, the, the total amount that we're investing in, in green public transit opportunities is going to significantly increase. So I can understand why um, looking at one fund in isolation, uh, you can come to the conclusion, oh, there's less money in this fund this year as compared to last year. Uh, but when you look across the system, which is what's most important to me, is are we doing what we can to maximize the value for the investment to get the emissions reduction and improvements in public transit? So I expect, depending on the specific uh, projects that a municipality may apply for, there may be enhanced eligibility as the permanent public transit fund comes online to get some of the same projects done because we've determined that it's a more efficient way to uh, have the federal government support uh, clean transit opportunities. The, these funds were announced at certain amounts and now those amounts have been reduced and so I don't see like the permanent public transit fund is also a fixed amount that's been announced. Um, I'm just wondering why the zero, emission, zero emissions transit fund went from 2.75 billion to 2.4 billion. It seems like it should be going the other direction. We should be adding more money to these funds. Is it because it was undersubscribed? Is there not interest from municipalities in securing these investments? So as part of the effort when we were seeking to refocus government spending, we were looking at the funds that best delivered the outcome uh, that we believe they were designed to achieve. When it comes to public transit, uh, the reason that you're seeing such a ramp up of the permanent public transit fund, which is the main way we fund uh, public transit for communities, we think we can get more done that way. So over the next number of years, particularly as the funding comes online in 2026, uh, you're going to see a consistent, uh, uh, reliable program uh, for the long term that municipalities can rely upon. Uh, rather than having uh, a program that sort of appeared for a short uh, piece of time. Uh, so that program is uh, undoubtedly going to show uh, some positive results, but our belief in the long term when it comes to supporting sustainable public transit is to have a much larger scale uh, consistent delivery mechanism through the per pu uh, public transit fund. So similarly, and there are issues with the permanent public transit fund, I'm not going to have time to get into them this round, but uh, similarly, the Rural Transit Solutions Fund, this is one mm. that impacts communities in the riding I represent, uh, went from $250 million to $150 million. So three years after Greyhound pulled its service entirely from Canada, and we have poorer bus service across the country in rural communities than we have in, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 years, uh, the government is pulling back on the key offering that they promised communities was going to help them recover from the withdrawal of, of uh, Greyhound services. Why has the Rural Transit Solutions Fund been reduced? Like surely the permanent public transit fund is not going to help rural communities uh, deliver bus transport. Uh, certainly it, it should, uh, and, and that's actually uh, part of the way that we're, and some of this uh, policy work remains to be finalized, but uh, that, that's actually one of the reasons that we want to make this sort of shift. Uh, so that, that fund, as a, again, newer item that we moved forward with a number of years ago, uh, also is the, the one that my community uh, can rely upon without a, a pre-existing municipally owned uh, public transit system, uh, didn't necessarily see the speed of uptake that I would have hoped for or, or thought for. But by establishing a more reliable criteria as part of the permanent public transit fund that smaller communities are eligible for, which we're working to develop right now, uh, we expect that there will be a simpler, uh, more consistent way for communities to access uh, public transit funding who may need a, a small bus uh, to do a, a loop around uh, a, a smaller se series of communities uh, rather than a, um, a subway system or a bus rapid transit system. Uh, so you should expect to see as the rollout of that fund comes to, uh, to life uh, that there will be a, uh, a feature designed specifically for rural communities that will be longer term and more reliable. Uh, moving to a, a transit challenge a little farther from the place that I represent, I know uh, folks in Toronto are very concerned about the aging uh, subway cars on the Bloor Line. Uh, the province and the city had a plan to replace those cars, but Toronto had to cancel its RFP 
because the feds wouldn't come to the table with the funds required uh, to make the purchase. And this affects not only commuters, but also uh, people in Thunder Bay who work for Alstrom that would be manufacturing these subway cars. Why uh, has your government um, allowed this key transit infrastructure to crumble and, and left workers wondering uh, about the future of these key manufacturing jobs? So when we're going to make uh, major investments uh, in um, a city's public transit system, which is primarily within a municipal or provincial uh, range of jurisdiction, uh, we want to make sure that we're setting it up for long-term success and understand what the long-term plans are. We don't have a, uh, a pot of money on the side to pull out of just to uh, put towards a problem as it arises when it comes to public transit. M maybe others think that would be desirable. Uh, my view is that we should provide uh, long-term sustainable funding for a long-term sustainable plan. Uh, that's where the permanent public transit fund is going to come in. We expect, although money flows in 2026, that we'll be able to book our first deals this calendar year because of the lead time uh, to book and pay for some of the uh, infrastructure required to build it a system. Uh, thank so you Toronto, very much, Minister. Uh, oh, thank you very much. Apologies, just want to make nope. sure everybody's getting some respect time. time. Thank you, Mr. Backrack. Next, we have Dr. Lewis. Dr. Lewis, the floor is yours once again. You have five minutes, please. Yes, so Minister, I want to ask you something specific that falls under your portfolio. As the Minister responsible for housing and who is accountable to the National Housing Agency, is the CEO of CMHC receiving a bonus this year? Uh, I don't uh, typically involve myself with the compensation of uh, employees of Crown Corps. I don't know what the status of a bonus. I would point out there's an interim CEO right now, and it may be a unique structure. Do you not see the budget of GRC contracts with the CEO? I could uh, uh, just as easily yield, although my deputies just uh, shared with me that it's a governor and council uh, process and that the bonus hasn't actually been determined. Hasn't been determined, okay. And do you think that it's fair that the, um, that the CEO of, uh, of CMHC receives a bonus in a year where housing starts or down? I think it's important that uh, elected officials don't uh, try to interfere with the compensation scheme set for public servants. I think it would be a bad practice. Uh, so from my perspective, if there is a process uh, that people were uh, following, that process ought to be followed. So performance could be dismal and your government would still, pay, would, would still think it's okay for public servants or um, CEOs of, of um, Crown Corporations or um, agencies to receive bonuses, even though performance is abysmal? Well, the performance uh, uh, standards reflected in a given bonus structure should, should reward performance. Uh, now, there's uh, housing conditions that are challenging that may be inside or outside of a person's control. Uh, but uh, again, uh, once you have a, a process designed to reward performance, uh, that process should be, uh, should be abided by. And when performance is down, there should be bonuses. Is that what you're, is that what you're saying? Yeah, those are your words, not mine. Okay. okay um, well, can we go back to one of your previous answers, ministers? You stated that um, the $4 billion housing accelerator fund that I referred to was incorrect, but that's actually on page 45 of the budget. Are you going to correct that response? You, you had said uh, 4.4 billion. Uh, 4 billion was administered previously. Not all of that money has actually been spent because most cases involve a municipality that only gets a 25% upfront payment. Uh, so we can protect against the risk uh, that a community wouldn't follow through on the performance that they've uh, agreed to in, in the uh, particular agreement. So, how many houses has been built as a result of that 4 billion that you? reference? Well, the specific funding uh, leads to systemic changes that will have uh, an impact over time. The communities that we've partnered with have indicated that over the next decade, they expect an increase in building permits issued of 750,000 across Canada. Okay. And so you see, we've seen property taxes, we've seen um, costs increase for homeowners in places like Toronto, while the federal government is dishing out $4 billion in a housing accelerator fund, will you commit today in not giving out any housing accelerator money to cities that increase development charges or other taxes on home buyers? Uh, when we deal with... Uh 
the development cost charges, we use the Canada Housing Infrastructure Fund that was in the recent federal budget, not the Housing Accelerator Fund, Minister. Uh, that we're uh, only funding infrastructure uh, differently, but the Housing Accelerator Fund agreement was designed not around development cost charges, so there's around no commitment permits today. and uh, I'm zoning move on practices. With my question. Um, your government has set some pretty ambitious targets to build the homes, to build homes in, uh, for Canadians. Your government's goal is 3.9 million homes in 2031. That's 1.096 homes must be built every minute. That's 65 homes per hour. We've been here just over 30 minutes. Has your government built 32 homes in the last 32 minutes, Minister? My view is that people who would suggest a problem is impossible to solve uh, shouldn't try to interfere with the person who's trying to actually solve it. If your goal is to throw up obstacles every way, uh, feel free, have a field day. Uh, I want to solve the housing crisis. Yeah. My goal My question, is actually based around what I think it will take to solve it. Point of order, Mr. As I expect, Mr. Chair. Point of order. Point of Sir, order. I have a point of order. We're going to stop the time. Yes, Ms. Katrakis. I just think that all of us around this table should be very respectful when we address each other, especially when we have a minister here who's very forthcoming and very honest and transparent and is trying his very best to answer us in a very respectful manner. Mr. Chair, I think that we should tone it down and we should allow the person that is answering the question to answer before we interrupt. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Katrakis. I don't point of order, Mr. Chair. No, I have another point of order from Mr. Yakino. Mr. Yakino. I'd like to also add to what my colleague uh, has just made as a comment. It's also for the uh, translation. When we have two people speaking at the same time, it becomes very hard for the translation. So I think it would be important to allow uh, the questions to be asked, the time for them to be asked, and also the time for them to be responded so that uh, translation can be done properly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Yakino. I'm just gonna go over to Mr. Strahl, uh, Dr. Lewis. Mr. Strahl, you have a point of order, sir? Yeah, yeah, on the same point of order, Mr. Chair, um, ministers are given the same amount of time to respond to the very limited amount of time that we have for questioning. And we certainly don't need Liberal MPs policing our tone when we're questioning a minister who is accountable and responsible uh, for their portfolio to Parliament. Thank you, Mr. Strahl. I will say, colleagues, just a quick reminder, uh, translation is extremely important. Um, I do want to remind everyone that we do need to give time for our translators to hear the question and the response. I know that we're all trying to get in as many questions as we can to the minister who is here with us today. It occurs every single time. So I just ask that we give opportunity for the minister to hear the question, to respond, uh, and then start with a second question. And with that, Dr. Lewis, I'll turn the floor back over to you and I'll add 15 seconds to your time. You have 45 seconds left. I, I, I'd like to comment on the point of order. So are you, are you not going, you're going to take I'll, that out of my time? Uh, no, I'll let you comment, but please do keep it minimal just because everybody right. still has the questions they would like to ask. Okay, thank you. So I, I just want to say I respect my colleagues' comments. Um, however, there's nothing impolite about holding a government to account. Mm -hmm. That is my job as opposition, and uh, we have very limited time, and I will definitely try to be respectful of the translators because they do need to do their job, and, and I appreciate the, the, the comments. Dr. Lewis, um, I'll start your clock now at 45 seconds. So, Mr. Minister, how many homes have you built, has your government built in the last 30 minutes? Uh, it's important to recognize that the government isn't the entity that is constructing the homes. We are putting incentives on the table to create the rule, uh, changes to the rules that make it easier to build a home. We have funding on the table, uh, but it's actually uh, the private sector and nonprofits who build the homes, not, not the government. How many projects has the infrastructure bank completed in the last seven years? Uh, do you have this? F 56. Completed? Com uh, those would be the, would, would have an agreement where the, the funding role, like, again, the bank itself doesn't complete the projects, they would finance the projects, so that would be how many they finance. So you, co you, you consider giving out money as a, as completed and as a benefit and as a, a result and outcome? Uh, th again, your words, not mine. That's how many they would have financed. The Thank projects you. would be at various stages of completion. Thank you very much, Minister, and thanks to you, Dr. Lewis. Next, we have Mr. Fillmore. Mr. Fillmore, the floor is yours. You have five minutes, sir. 
Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, Minister and uh, Deputy Minister, for joining us today. Um, Minister, I was very pleased, many of us were, to see the discussion of federal lands in the in Budget 2024 being positioned as a part of the solution to the provision of housing, including affordable housing in Canada. You and I have discussed my proposal to use Canada Post lands on the Halifax Peninsula, so thank you for keeping that in focus. But this, um, this idea of leveraging federal lands to address the housing crisis, it, uh, to, through my lens, it accomplishes two key things. It can mitigate the cost of land uh, in transactions, which are a huge driver of, of cost uh, for the end user, but also um, it can improve the supply of land that's on already serviced land. So with those two things in mind, I wonder if you could just sort of lay out for us what uh, your department's approach is to the uh, uh, plan is to use uh, federal lands, and if you could um, try to, uh, in, while you're answering, think about the challenges that the program faces, the big opportunities that you see, and what you think some of the timelines might be. Sure. Look, thanks. And, and uh, before I get too far, I should acknowledge the uh, advocacy work you've been doing about that specific parcel in, in Halifax, which is part of the uh, helped inform part of the decision making around uh, what we want to do as we design some of these uh, programs. So I, I think you've you've described it the right way. There's largely two benefits uh, to having uh, the strategy that we've adopted around uh, federal lands. Uh, the first that you mentioned is on cost. So th there's certain costs that are within the control of governments or the government can introduce a solution to. There are others that are outside the scope of what the government can influence directly. Uh, land is one where we actually have an opportunity to reduce the input cost because the price of land, particularly in larger urban centres, is driving up the cost and delaying uh, the number of homes that are ultimately built. By putting land on the table, we can help reduce that cost uh, provided we get a good deal. If you sell that land off, you don't necessarily get the same value proposition because you don't pull the cost of land out of the input cost of construction. We're proposing in most instances to move forward with long-term leases that are offered at a low price to reduce the cost of construction uh, in exchange for commitments around affordability. Uh, on the supply piece, in addition to making land available that would not otherwise be made available for land, uh, we have the opportunity to do more and the, the Canada Post project I know you're interested in uh, or, or uh, uh, more broadly, uh, properties like that have an opportunity to contribute uh, more supply over and above the usual disposition process around federal lands. And that's because when you enter into a leasing arrangement, you have an opportunity to expand the scope beyond properties that are declared surplus, but to also include properties uh, which are not mutually exclusive to the idea of housing that could still play some other public purpose. Uh, so when you look at the possibility of adding homes to a property that um, a Canada Post location could have, for example, uh, it could still serve as a Canada Post location, uh, but also serve as a housing development. Uh, where that's possible, we don't want to limit ourselves only to those that have to go through the more lengthy disposition process, where you would also forego the... Um, the cost advantage of making lands available uh, um, without uh, adding that input cost towards construction. Okay, thank you. I appreciate the uh, the expansion of the idea there. Keep, keeping with the uh, the notion that the federal government can reduce costs for municipalities, um, I recently uh, spoke at the annual meeting of CUTA, the Canadian Urban Transit Association in Halifax, and I can tell you that uh, it's a group that's very uh, very excited and very happy about the prospect of the permanent public transit fund. Um, Increasingly, we're hearing uh, from municipalities that uh, there's a sense that they are bearing a disproportionate share of the cost of growth uh, uh, in having it with population growth, um, having to uh, build infrastructure and services, um, including transit systems, to, supp to support new population growth. And I think it's this kind of federal program that can sort of help out municipalities who have no ability to borrow money or, or carry debt or, or in limited means to raise money. So having sort of with all that preamble, um, how do you see the, uh, the public transit fund helping to address the, the costs of growth that municipalities are facing? Look, this is really important, and FCM's doing some really interesting work around a new proposed municipal growth framework. Uh, until we figure out sort of the long-term shifts between levels of government to fund municipal infrastructure, we want to be there with money uh, to help ensure that they can pay for the assets that help achieve the different goals that we all want to see, a more livable community, uh, more opportunities for people to reach uh, employment opportunities, access services, all the good things that come with a healthy functioning transit system. Um, 
we wanted to put money on the table uh, to ensure communities don't have to consider the other kinds of costs that were discussed. I know during a previous set of questions around development cost charges, property taxes were raised as well. There's a fairly limited number of tools municipalities have right now. So if other levels of government, provinces and the federal government, don't step up with long-term reliable funding, municipalities have to ask themselves where that revenue is going to come from or they have to choose not to grow. Uh, choosing not to grow right now would be a horrible mistake. Canada is poised for enormous success and it's going to be led in a lot of ways uh, by cities and, and communities of different sizes. Uh, but if we're going to expect them to achieve the level of growth that promotes certain national interests, we have to make sure that they're funded to build out the supports to allow community to thrive. I would go on, but the time has been exhausted. Thank you, Minister, and thank you, Mr. Fillmore. Prochain man, nous avons Mr. Basse-Louval. Avez-vous la parole? Mr. Basse-Louval, uh, two and a half minutes, sir. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Minister. Previously, I was uh, talking of uh, perhaps interference in municipal affairs, and I give you a few examples. I'd like to read an extract of the Federation of Municipalities of Quebec. The 24-25 federal budget is an attack on municipal uh, responsibilities. Following the, the, the tabling of the budget 24-25 uh, uh, by the Honorable Minister Friedland, we announced that municipalities in uh, developing their uh, responsibilities would like to point out that uh, there should be a review of the imposition of the carbon tax, uh, which was announced in December. Many measures presented by the federal government is in, in, in interference or overstepping infrastructure, housing, addi addi addition of conditions on development uh, charges. It uh, doesn't really take into consideration uh, local realities. For example, the, inter the infrastructure, we should come to a more uh, clear and transparent agreement with the government of Quebec, not just from an article. Do you think that uh, Quebec is being well advised and well consulted, and do you think that uh, you will succeed that way? I feel it's very uh, important. There are certain values underlying federal investments. Obviously, there will be some changes which will help to accelerate uh, creation of new housing. The essential point, actually, is if I take a decision to invest to create housing, or any other infrastructure uh, project, it's important that we actually meet targets, get results. But the municipalities of Quebec is uh, channeling a message. They don't like this agreement, and they see it as an interference in municipal affairs. Uh, same, we, we, uh, we confirm that position. What's going to happen to that money if everybody says, no, thank you? Uh, the money stays in Ottawa, and municipalities in Quebec are going to um, not get what they need, although they're paying taxes to Quebec, to Canada. Uh, well, uh, Quebec, I think, has the rules and laws in place uh, to avoid any complications. Uh, my counterpart uh, is there, and we do discuss to arrive at, a, at a, an agreement with the province in order to facilitate new housing and to increase the number of, of uh, housing units. Uh, the discussion is an ongoing discussion. I mean, uh, we'll, be keep, we'll keep working on it in future. And well, I'm sorry, Chair. No, that's fine, Mr. Minister, and thank you, Mr. Pelsdall. Cracked floor is yours. Two and a half minutes, please, sir. I'm going to try to uh, fit in two questions. So, um, Minister, if you could be uh, brief. On page 50 of the budget, it says $1 billion will be available directly to municipalities to support infrastructure needs that will directly enable housing supply. There are several rural communities in northwest BC that need to replace their wastewater systems. I think of Port Clements on Haida Gwaii and Fort St. James. Um, I guess two 
aspects to this question. One is how do you define directly enabling housing supply, recognizing that communities also have infrastructure deficits and failing wastewater systems? Um, and secondly, what is the timing on this billion dollar fund and how can communities access it? Uh, this funding will be uh, spent this fiscal year. Uh, the process uh, will launch, I expect, in the fall, uh, and we'll be hoping to make decisions by the end of the calendar year. Um, the process to apply uh, won't, won't open for a few months because we're now designing the program. Fantastic. I'm going to give my remaining minute to Mr. Morris, who I understand has a question, many questions, <laughs> but he gets one. Uh, thank you, Taylor, and you, thank sir. you, Chair. Uh, Minister Fraser, unsurprisingly, back to ask about two-way all day go between Kitchener and Toronto. I want to start by saying thank you. I appreciate the time you've been making uh, and your team as well to have conversations uh, about calling for accountability from the province. In this case, funds have already been committed from the federal government. I was 40% uh, of the project funds, uh, as you know, have been committed already. It's a project that was committed over a decade ago. And we still just don't even have a timeline from the province. And so I appreciate in my last conversation with folks on your team, um, they committed that in your next meeting with your provincial counterpart, that this would be on the agenda uh, with, with them. Can you just confirm that that is the case, that it, that is on the agenda for that next meeting? And if possible, if you've got a date for that meeting, would love to hear about it. If that's not something you have top of mind, that's okay too, but would love to know uh, when that, uh, meeting is and whether two way all day go between Kitchener to Toronto is on the agenda. Uh, thank you. Uh, the next meeting uh, that's currently scheduled will be between June 26th and 28th, though it's possible there could be an additional meeting sooner than that. Um, because the agenda isn't formally set, it wouldn't be fully honest to say it's actively on it, but I'll commit to you here to make sure that it gets on, although it just may not technically be done from a, a formal point of view. Thank you, Mr. Morris. Next, we have Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett, the floor is yours. You have five minutes, sir. Minister, who is Andre Lee's Mathot? Um, I don't know them personally. I understand they've held a few uh, board positions uh, within different uh, federal organizations. Okay. And so, um, Ms. Mathot uh, was announced to be a member of the Canada Infrastructure Bank, appointed. Uh, by the Trudeau government. She came from the Sustainable Development Technology Canada, which is also known as the Billion Dollar Green Slush Fund. And uh, part of the reason it's known as that is because of um, some of the work of Ms. Mathot, including her financial interest in a group of companies that she voted to give 42 million taxpayer dollars to. Do you endorse her serving on the Infrastructure Bank? Uh, I actually uh, understand that person has resigned, so uh, there's, there is no such service to endorse. And on what date did Ms. Mathot resign? Uh, the 16th of April. So we have this, what is pretty plain to see, or what would be perceived to be as, as corruption. We have people serving uh, on boards uh, appointed by the government. They... Uh, are rewarded after it's revealed that um, there's been these kinds of insider dealings. Multiple other people on, on the board um, who were uh, GIC appointments um, being under investigation by the Ethics Commissioner and then being appointed to the Infrastructure Bank, a larger pool of money with which they could advantage their own, uh, pri further their own private interests and advantage themselves. So uh, this individual offered their resignation um, was that the, you know, following an announcement of an investigation by yourself into, um, into their dealings while serving on the Infrastructure Bank? Uh, no, I've, I've made no such announcement uh, to that kind of an investigation. I would just uh, caution, I don't know this person. Uh, I, I do know that there was some uh, reasons uh, to look into the work uh, at SDTC. Uh, while inquiries uh, are ongoing to uh, make allegations of corruption just in a general way, I, I think uh, sets a dangerous precedent, and I would uh, uh, urge caution on all members uh, in advance of any explicit findings because of the impact that those kinds of statements can have uh, on a person permanently throughout the yeah, course of their life. Sure. I, I appreciate your caution, Minister, but it's a matter of public record, you know, Ms. Mathot's uh, personal interests and then the decisions that she took uh, while serving on the SDTC board, and then went on to receive um, what is uh, you know, a, pres a, a prestigious uh, 
Mr. Baird, just one second, please. I'll stop your time. I have a point of order for Mr. Biddle. Mr. Biddle. I guess I'm just curious who um, Mr. Baird is subbing in for. All the regular members of the Conservative Party are here, and if they're here, they're um, uh, participating. So I was just wondering who um, Mr. Baird is, is subbing in for. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to respond to Mr. Biddle. He can be present, even if other members are here. We can be present. Can he be participating? But he can't be voting. Okay, but okay. So I'm, I'm an associate member of the committee, Mr. Yes. Chair, and, and I'm able to uh, participate as a, uh, as a member of the official opposition. And um, if my colleagues are generous in sharing their uh, opportunity to question the minister with me, I'm, I'm able to do that, provided I abide by the rules of the committee and don't cast a vote um, when regular members uh, or, or permanent members of the committee are present. That is correct. Okay. I'll turn the floor back over to you and I'll start your time. You have two and a half minutes left, sir. Point of order, Mr. Chair. I'll go to Ms. Katrakis. Yeah, I'm just uh, questioning the relevance of this line of questioning because we are here on Maine's uh, estimates. So I'd just like to find out what the relevance is. Thank you, Ms. Katrakis. Um, I'll ask all members to try and find a way to segue or explain uh, the line of questioning as it relates to the Maine estimates. And with that, I'll turn the floor back over to you, Mr. Barrett. Okay, look, it's, uh, it's beyond rich. I've got one member uh, of the government who... Uh, who doesn't want me to even be able to ask questions, though it's, of course, established that I'm able to do so. We have another member um, saying that my questions aren't relevant when we're asking the minister responsible for infrastructure about appointments to the infrastructure board. It screams cover-up when we're talking about questions of corruption that have been well reported on uh, in the media and are rightly concerning uh, for Canadians who have, uh, who have a hard time paying their bills and we have insiders who are lining their pockets while they have plum government appointments and access to make decisions uh, that, that personally benefit uh, themselves. Minister, would you be able to uh, table for the committee following your appearance um, the, the resignation letter or official notice from, your, uh, from the infrastructure bank um, that that resignation uh, did in fact take place on the date that you uh, indicated? So I, I don't have a copy. I'd be happy to undertake to request uh, that the Canada Infrastructure Bank provide that to me. That's, that's excellent. The, the concern and the reason that I, that I raised this, of course, Dr. Lewis um, uh, very uh, ably put questions to you about the completion of projects by the Infrastructure Bank. And so we have questions about the efficacy and, and the competence um, of the organization. With respect to any future appointments, um, we'd of course expect that uh, those appointments are given to people who have not been implicated in, uh, in, in questions of uh, self-dealing. But will you commit today to undertake a review of decisions that Ms. Mathot participated in while serving on uh, the infrastructure bank so as to be able to assure Canadians that no further insider dealing was undertaken by Ms. Mathot? So I, I'm uh, ha happy to look into it. Some of the elements might be properly administered by uh, the bank in the first instance uh, as an uh, uh, entity that operates independent of government, but I've got no reservations to looking into it. I think we all owe it to our constituents to make sure that there's not uh, inappropriate use of uh, taxpayers' money, even, even when it's run by an arm's length organization and the money's paid back. Mr. Barrett, and thank you, Minister. And finally for today, we have Ms. Kutrakis. Ms. Kutrakis, the floor is yours. You have five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Minister, for being here with us today. Um, I just wanted to add to the question of my honorable colleague, uh, Mr. Backrack. Uh, we ran out of time. He shared uh, his time with uh, another colleague here. So I wanted to go back to the uh, Canada Housing Infrastructure Fund and the billion-dollar investment. And if you could share with us how this fund will accelerate the construction of water, wastewater, and solid waste infrastructures, which are critical to housing development. Uh, I'm specifically looking at the how. 
Sure. Uh, so th there's two ways. Uh, in some communities, there is a uh, it's uh, the lack of uh, infrastructure is a bottleneck to housing growth. They literally don't have the service capacity to add new homes in particular parts of the community, uh, and they don't have the financial means to pay for those services to be established. So the first and most direct way is we're going to help pay for the infrastructure so they actually have the water pipe that will ensure that water comes out when you turn the tap. That's the most direct way. Uh, but it's also going to have a very positive and indirect benefit in terms of the how uh, that will inspire uh, more home building in a given community because we're restricting eligibility to communities who adopt certain kinds of changes that make it easier and faster to build homes, including freezing development cost charges, including adopting more as of right zoning so you don't get tied up in council for a year to get an approval for a basic project, including uh, adopting uh, designs out of the National Home Design Catalog that will make them easier to get through the process, including uh, adopting changes to the building code that will help uh, uh, do develop consistency in home production through designs that are more affordable for the person to live in at the end of the day. So there's a number of different ways, both direct and indirect, uh, but we're putting money on the table to incentivize changes to the rules and that money can be used to build the infrastructure that makes it possible to build houses. And I'm wondering, uh, Minister, uh, you know, my home uh, province of Quebec, there is the law of uh, M30, which you alluded to earlier. Um, how are we, how is your ministry working with the province of Quebec to see how um, the Canada Housing Infrastructure Fund could benefit that province? What is the, the, the relationship like? What are the conversations like? It's been very positive in my experience uh, dealing with my Quebec counterparts uh, since I've had this portfolio and in fact before uh, and I find that uh, for the most part uh, they want the same thing. Uh, they want to address the housing crisis as a provincial government and they would like federal support to do it. Um, as a result of certain changes that uh, make it more difficult to engage directly with communities it can sometimes go more slowly than I would like or, or than it does with other provinces uh, but ultimately if we can find a partner at a provincial level who's willing to make certain kinds of changes um, then we get a better deal. Uh, if The irony b b behind a lot of these funds is because they tend to be in areas of provincial jurisdiction uh, that the changes that are incentivized, uh, though we have the authority to, to do it in this fashion, um, a lot of these changes could be made by provincial governments without federal support, uh, but they weren't happening. Uh, so we're creating incentives to inspire those kinds of changes because we know as a direct and predictable result there will be more homes built as a consequence. How am I doing on time? Yeah, uh, you have two minutes left, Ms. Katrakis. Okay, thank you. And uh, we also know the importance of uh, tying infrastructure dollars to building more home near public transit. You've alluded to in, in several questions to uh, answer in your answers to several questions. Um, can you share with the committee the importance of creating high density housing uh, close to rapid transit? And and, and are those asks by uh, various jurisdictions, provinces, territories? So this doesn't seem to get a lot of uh, pushback because uh, most people see the uh, the good sense behind uh, moving forward with this kind of an approach. Um, the conversations will vary between provinces or, or uh, in a given city. Uh, but there's two main reasons I, I think it's going to be successful. Uh, one, it's a lot of money being put on the table in exchange for commitments to change certain rules uh, pursuant to my last answer that will uh, result in more homes being built. Uh, but second, transit systems don't work if people don't live nearby to take it. Uh, if you actually uh, increase density within walking distance to a transit system, you're setting up the system for success that won't require continued support for the, its operations because it can be self-financing. If more people who use the system live within walking distance of the system, uh, more people will use it. Uh, and uh, when you have that ridership number climb up, uh, the ability to fund and maintain the assets within the system will become uh, uh, much easier uh, and uh, much more reliable. Thank you very much, Ms. Koutrakis. And thank you very much, Minister and Deputy Minister, for appearing before us today and so generously answering the questions posed by members. Colleagues, I see that the bells are ringing for a vote, uh, so we will suspend until the vote is over, at which time we will welcome members of the department. With that, the meeting is suspended.